All right, welcome back. Uh, we've been talking about lighting, uh, various lightings, I think, for portraits primarily. Sort of, I guess more than that, but talking about uh, values in lighting, whether you can get form without values, of course, which you can't. <laughs> but uh, certainly not any great expression of form. In theory, you could have something, but you wash out the form if you take away all the values, right? You just can't see form, so. But this is a follow-up for that video, just a very brief one, because Terry came back with uh, this comment. Could you describe the lighting setup one would need to achieve the inverse contrast? Light side of face against dark background with dark side of face against lighter background for portraits. Again, assuming that I understand the details correctly. Thank you, Terry. Terry B. Uh, Terry, before we go into this, actually, I want to give a thank you to... Uh, David D. Again, David, you are, thank you for being a, such a uh, kind patron of our what we're trying to do here. I know you're trying to do something to uh, teaching, and uh, so keep it up. And um, and to John W., he, he gave me an interesting number, I, which I haven't figured out yet. It must be a Q thing or something. <laughs> Dear Mr. Pauling Britson and Whitaker, this donation is long overdue. And, and embarrassingly small for the riches you've brought to my life through the videos on painting. Thank you so very much for making this information available to me. Uh, yeah, I hear that more than once, and I thank, and you're very welcome, uh, John. Uh, and that's a very uh, kind donation. <laughs> I don't, I have never been able to figure out how to measure anything in how much. Ever since Christ tells the story and says, look at the widow at the widow's might, and he says, look, she's given more than all these rich people combined. I, I don't know if he said combined, <laughs> but you, because she gave everything she had, and I do not want anybody giving their last penny for painting, although I admire you if you could do it. <laughs> not for me, but <laughs> to, to, because of a certain value. I think there are things that are more valuable in life, but as you know, but... Um, Let's go back. Let's go ahead and start up. But anyway, thank you, gents, and uh, all you people who have been doing this for such a long time, keeping up with me and helping me to keep up with uh, the expenses. I think we're, <coughs> we're holding our own just at the moment, uh, according to Mr. Producer there. Also, um, I, I would apologize to you for uh, disappearing on you last week, except Mr. Producer is the cause this time, which you, if you've read that, you know. But uh, I think I can tell you now that he was actually in the Ukraine uh, with a film crew. And uh, so he was, he was um, uh, doing his job. He was, he was at work. And um, my, little, my little piece of the woods is now picking up again. He's, he's back in, in one piece. Uh, so... Thank you for your patience and all that, and uh, and uh, so on. So on doesn't go very far, does it? So let's uh, so so describe the lighting setup. So we did this lighting discussion. Let's just go to pictures. Um, we did this lighting discussion last week, and I don't have to be long about this. Oh, and there's a second part to this today, and that is I want to talk about the color, the skin color, and portraits, and how that relates, or how you might think about it when you're setting up a portrait. And uh, because someone, and I can't, couldn't find, again, I couldn't find who it was. It might have been a person, someone in person, or it might have been an email. I couldn't find it, though, where somebody was asking about the color of skin. And, uh, and I, I, I wanted to say the context was, well, let me tell you a story. <laughs> I did have a, um, a lady work with me once um, a, um, who said, uh, who said, could you just tell me the formula for skin colors? And I, and I laughed, and I, didn't, I hope I didn't laugh in an offensive way, but I said, I don't have any formula for skin colors. We, everything is made out of red, yellow, and blue, and we search for the color note in relation to other color notes. We, search, you know, we, we make the color movements and all those things out of red, yellow, and blue. Again, that nice quote from Fetchin, I think it was last week, uh, that was, I hope I offered that to you. If I didn't, uh, I, somebody remind me, I'll try to remember to do it. Um, where he said that he says, he says color is just red, yellow, and blue, and and so rather in a certain way, 
the spectrum as we once we see a prism breaking the colors down we say oh oh so that is the content of the of the world of that we live in you know the world of the sun the world of light and uh, so and it goes as as you know it goes from some some serious violets all the way through um, and back again through the through the uh, blues and the reds and the yellows and the, and the uh, uh, et cetera, the greens, purples, whatever. I forgot to mention orange. I mean, the whole thing is the Munzel wheel does it really well. Munzel isn't about light as much as how to mix colors, the uh, primary colors and the secondary colors. Uh, so that's all useful information. Do do that. Pay attention. Uh, I don't know how deep you want to go with it, but uh, uh, my friend Graydon Parrish is, uh, and I say my friend, meaning we have a good relationship, albeit mostly online. Uh, and uh, and I do uh, know that he gets around with that conversation. It's a worthy conversation, the Munzel conversation. I just say keep it practical, though. Um, red, yellow, and blue is key, though. So that's a different part of the discussion. I got I got I got I wanted to mention both of those at the beginning. So now I finally have. All right. So we're going to start with just this lighting. This is a very simple lighting, and I commend this lighting to you for one reason. If along with the idea of what. Uh, Paxton says it's, or I mean, Degas says it's all silhouettes. These Paxtons uh, are are lovely in silhouette. He makes excellent use of of of, of that aspect of what we call pattern, the, the uh, sort of cutout shapes. And uh, but in so, but the way you ask it, you're asking about the light in the background getting lighter on one side and being darker on the other. Well, typically this lighting happens on the wall. If you look at the woman on the right, and that's not a portrait, but but a uh, one of his sort of, I would say it's a classic Paxton, woman in an interior, very undoubtedly much influenced by the, uh, by, the uh, Vermeer, um, by the Vermeer idea. Someone once said about uh, Paxton, some of his work, somebody said that's, that's rather near Vermeer. And this other person said to be near Vermeer is to be mere veneer. Uh, I can't tell you who said that. Uh, but you know this is beautiful work here and stands on its own, albeit near Vermeer. So, and by the way, I didn't, I did look, I didn't see Vermeer doing this, um, if if once even, the, what I'm talking about here. But what I'm going to show you, what I'm showing you now, is that the light on the wall here goes from light to less light, right? Just there's a movement in value from light to dark. But this design to set up, this if there were no hair here, <clears throat> this light here would glow against that value. And create a silhouette, and and it still does a little bit with the hair, but that's in a inversely. This is maybe a better example. The here's a skin edge of edge of a face against the background, that's giving you the face as the silhouette. So this is beautifully set up to articulate that. You have a beautiful, if you have an if you have an excellent expressive contour there, you want to be able to play it right, not just lose it. On the other side, you see that that. It's again probably not by much moving a little bit from light to dark here, but still on the other side you can see the darks on the head are actually darker. You can look at this as your example, darker than this, and so they give you an opportunity to create a silhouette on this side as well. So it, I wouldn't make more of it than that. We're doing that uh, because it's one of the classic approaches, but it's the approach that delivers the most. Uh, I, what you make they call it a. a, a, a Simplified version, simplified um, um, presentation of the data of the head. Now, um, so I, I'm not much going into. In fact, I'm not going into this at all. But there are tons of portraits where the darks on the side here just bury the whole right side is buried. There are other portraits that are so light here and here that you can almost not see this side, and. Um, and so, so it's not unusual. This is this is sort of this halfway place, if you want to say it that way, where there's a silhouette on both sides. But you know, the, one of the recommendations is if you're going to have a silhouette on both sides, make sure one of them is the dominant one. In both cases, it's the lighter side dominating the other side. And I say dominating, meaning the contrast is greater here, and the contrast is weaker over there, making this the dominant. Okay. And this does the same thing. It's very much you don't want them to be equal. Equals isn't one of your friends. It flattens the image out, which of course is when you talk about the form of the room and all that sort of thing, uh, it's not one of your ideal things. But this is to get across to you all we mean by uh, a, this is a lighter background, but dark enough to silhouette the light side of the face on one side and the dark side 
uh, of the face on the other side, as if this making this appear to be a light, this one appear to be a dark in simple context of the area it's in. Okay, have I already confused everybody? Uh, Terry, hang in there. This is Joseph DeCamp in a couple pictures doing exactly the same thing. You see the powerful setup of the profile here on the face. Would you guys be happier if I used my, my, my uh, Mr. Producer would be happier if I used my red there we go. Uh, but you can see the beautiful profile here, beautifully set up by the background value to pop. And then this one, and this is again a, a value that doesn't seem to be much moving. In this case here, it might be just slightly lighter on the right side. Certainly slightly bluer on the right side, but, uh, which isn't relevant. But, um, but you can see this is a weaker contrast over here, but it's all there, all, the whole contrast is there. And this value, if it was just the neck, for example, hitting the background, would still be dark enough to make a silhouette against this. So this is not an unusual thing. It's just like I said, it's like the halfway zone, and then you can go all the way toward losing the shadow side completely or losing the right, right side completely, more or less, right? But painting, you know, these are fairly the limits. Go and go and go and have some fun. You can do, obviously, you can stick a light object and lose the face here, and put a dark object and lose the other side here, and then live on the shadow line, shall we say? Uh, and so there's this other one, I believe, of his wife, uh, and uh, here again the silhouette on the the weak side, <clears throat> and the strong side contrast, and this side again does appear to be darker over here and lighter on this side. So however you do that, these aren't light backgrounds though. So if you're implying that, Terry, that's not necessary, but this is what I'm talking about. This is one of the lighter ones that I have here. And this is the Velasquez version of it. Again, light enough to silhouette against this. And, and uh, the side of this side, the shadow side of the head, dark enough to make the wall look light on the other side and creating a silhouette for you. Okay, and that would have been true on this one too, but this is one of my favorite portraits. So I had to throw that in there. But this, is, uh, this isn't by much. Again, this is darker on this side. So this would be probably the corner of a room and, and, and the window. <clears throat> uh, this would be some sort of, you know, a penumbra presumably down through here. But the thing is getting lighter as it goes to the right. Uh, not so much this one here. Again, you don't have to have really high contrast on the left side. It, I mean, there's no law about it. So if you understand what I'm saying, you just simply find some contrast. Uh, and, and create, decide how much featuring you're going to have here. This is almost flattening out because the featuring here, the contrast here is, almost, is similar enough to this that you can see how that would tend to flatten that area out. And this whole painting has, of course, that look of being rather a flat thing as a, uh, because the cut, at, at least it looks flattened because the silhouettes on both sides are similarly strong. It's a curious thing. Uh, this one actually feels more, as it were, 3D um, because, and uh, again, I'll give you that projectivity factor. These things project, this stuff here projects much less. And so it, whether it's, it, well, it's, it's just one of the things that happens. As with color, you know, things happen and you take advantage of them. Uh, there's no right or wrong in all this sort of stuff. There is a right or wrong in the sense of, are you bringing the beauty? Are you bringing, are you bringing the, uh, the uh, for example, when you're, when you're trying, to, when you are addressing the form of the space, are you, are you uh, doing it with good, you know, timing in terms of things deep, you know, projectivity and all that stuff. Uh, and are those things discussed? Are those things all in your head at once? You remember remember thinking about uh, Reynolds saying genius lies and seeing the thing as a whole. Now the one on the on the right, now these are two Rayburns, and the one on the right, I should have put names on these. I apologize for that, you guys who like that. Um, but I, I didn't, so here we are. But this is one where you can see the background is almost the same, just by a little bit. This part of the face is more lit than this, but it never does silhouette against this. So this is relatively speaking lost. This forms the silhouette, but still it's the same lighting, brighter over here, darker over here. That's just where the window's hitting uh, closer, where the wall is, where he's against the wall and the, and the light is washing across here. Again, silhouetting on the right side, but this is where I was saying you can lose that if you, if you happen to choose to. It's a matter of the beauty of the effect, the, the fascination with the effect, the, if you want to say the poetic or expressive content as well. Uh, you know, some create, creation of some sort of a, perhaps a certain kind of mystery. Um, uh, 
the the loss of the cheek is is it, it isn't a common. I mean, most people or or I should say most frequently the cheek is it, you leave a glint of light there. It's not a law, no no requirement. But in both of his, these appear to be uh, significantly not there. These shadows are relatively flat. There's a little hint of it on this one here, and I forget the names of the characters in these portraits. Um, Gamma wouldn't approve that. He preferred if you're going to use pictures, you know the names, the the uh, the um, title of the painting. So with apologies to Mr. Gamble. Now here's another one again when we're saying the silhouette, you can see how strong that is. Now if you look at both of them at once, if you are aware of this, be aware of that silhouette, contrast it with this silhouette, you'd say this is the stronger side. If the guy didn't have hair there and this cheek right against the background, I think it would still be the stronger effect. But um, but you can see that in the order of effects. Effects just means contrast an edge and combination that produce this projective quality. Um, we call them light effects. Nothing we make is light in one sense at all, obviously, because it's a flat plane, it's just color values. So it's always about the effect of light, the effect light produces. So here's Ang doing it. Not a commonplace with Ang uh, either, but here's the cheek side silhouetting against the background that's somewhat darker than the left side than the shadow side background, the shadow side of the head, the background on the shadow side of the head, being slightly lighter than this. Now, by the way, that might not even be true, uh, but you can. But the sense of it is that it's that way. It could be that this will just appear uh, lighter. And that's one of those wonderful things about how you have to look many ways to make sure you're not getting faked out. I don't know, somebody mentioned it uh, not so long ago that you could hold up a, a, a middle tone or, or a dark, or even a white piece of paper and if you hold it at the same plane, you can look at it and, and move it from one side to the other and see which one of them has the greater, which one of them is more different from the thing you're holding in front of you, which side is more different. You can hold them up at once together uh, and, and, and observe the values on the left and right side. So I'm saying if I put a, a, a black thing right here, I'd be able to see if there's more contrast against the black where this hits it. I'm just saying put a board, a plate up in front of your sitter, a board, a, a black board or any, any value, and just see if there's greater contrast or less contrast on this side versus this side, this against your board, which would be sitting right here. I hope that's clear to you that you can do that. Um, this is one where, <clears throat> this is a much more typical one in the way we set up casts, or a lot of students do, we all did, I should say, where the light is actually created to be lighter on the right side, <clears throat> on, on one side and create it to be darker on the other, and here's the reason for it right here. Sometimes you'll hang a cloth back in the background, so it'll be, so it'll, this cloth here will set off this side, and or hang a lighter cloth over here, so it'll set off this side the amount you want. It does leave you with this disturbance in the forest. It, if you, you, know, it, you may like, prefer to have a head without that kind of stuff uh, hanging around it. But when you're into a room anyway, all this stuff is just benefit to, you know, benefits the, um, the, the general atmosphere of the room. So I better keep moving along here. But you see that I, what I'm saying, there's not a whole lot of, um, uh, this isn't a very, <laughs> I'm making a big thing out of a little thing. It's, it should be fairly simple to understand. Terry, I hope that's coming across to you. Here's Degas doing it, one of my favorite Degas portraits. <clears throat> and a second ago, I would have told you the name of this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. I <laughs> uh, hope it's not you, but it doesn't, it don't let words get in your way of, of actually appreciation. But here you can see the light effect and contrast. Here's the sharpest edge on this back wall, back part of her hair. And then here's the contrast on this side. And they're very, they're very near in their projectivity. Well, not in this area here, this whole area taken together, this thing's way more projective than that side. But long down through here, this is similarly, they, it's almost, they're almost in the same place visually, to my mind. Uh, it's very funny how that happens, though. These contrasts, these these these, these uh, joints, um, these points of effect. If you look at them simultaneously, one of them will gradually start receding. Especially if you blur your eyes, one of them will start receding away from you, and one of them will stay. Uh, uh, but anyway, so but that's again the background, which appears to be lighter on this side and darker on this side, which could very well be the same, except that it looks like there is a movement to light from this side to here. When you have a clear path like that where you can see it, you can make a better judgment of it. And the rest is, of course, based on effects. But that's, this is that again. This is where the light side silhouettes as if the, against a wall, against a lighter wall. And uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, against what appears uh, against a middle tone wall, where this is now the light against that middle tone. This is now the dark against that middle tone, making this look light. The middle tone look light in this case and dark in this case. Very typical. This is more unusual. This kind of a thing here, where she is so, she is. I don't even know if she's lighter than the background. Boy, it's so close. Uh, but so here's that classic case of being lost over here. He's using a light light background, but he's even though this is the shadow side, and this would undoubtedly, if it was if her ear was touching that yellow, would appear to be in greater contrast than this side. It's still one of those setups. In this case here, we're not making virtually any use of the. There is no contrast. Blue your eye, there really is no contrast here. So the hair is rather required to give you a line. Um, that is to say, to give you a boundary if you want it to read, and if you want that side of the face not to simply recede. I don't know if I have any of those where I do simply recede. I don't think I do. Well, let's um, start our last second part of our conversation. I hope that comes across to you, Terry. <laughs> second part. <laughs> Oh, I actually probably should do this one first, but this is that. This is Rembrandt doing the same thing. Uh, and you can see he does some very interesting things with the lights. He's got a light coming in here and just cutting down through here. He's blocked it up here so that casts a shadow on the wall. He's looking to have interesting effects. And he's already into this stuff as a young man when he's doing more imaginative work and doing a lot of stuff out of his head, but he's very much interested in the light. He is like, and I'm talking about observed light, much like uh, Velasquez. And... Uh, so, but just mentioning he's doing a similar lighting where the shadow side looks dark against the light. And if this were against the skin, this would be a light skin against the background. In this case, the hair is being used, as, as often the case, as the silhouetting, as, as the chief silhouette against the background on both sides. So whatever that's worth to you. But this is the same kind of lighting, and that's all I'm trying to mention it for. So Terry, that's it for today. I, I uh, at the beginning, said I was going to talk about color, and I think I'm not going to, but I'll tell but I'll uh, introduce you to the idea, and I'll do that in the next video. But So the idea here is that you can make skin appear to be anything you want it to. Skin, you know, what we talk about, there was a book once called Color Me Beautiful, and it's a very right way of thinking. You want to make a, a woman or man's skin look good, look healthy, then the colors you surround that person with are going to help or hinder that. So if a person has a very sallow complexion, the more sallow the background is, the more you, the reds will be featured on the face. It's a very standard kind of thing. But in reverse, you'll see that on the uh, head of, um, of Napoleon here, these two are by Delaroche. The reds, which appear to have been required in this painting, were desired by the, by, by the emperor, <laughs> whatever he called himself, um, uh, makes the skin look really kind of sick if you don't look hard at it. If you look into it, you can see some reds and things, but it looks rather sick. It's not an unusual thing for Red to do that. Here's a rusty one. This is at the museum in Boston, uh, the MFA. And I've never liked this picture. And I think this is actually a little too yellow. I think this is even rustier in the background. But, it, but, but this is a wonderful example of how the skin can look dead. It looks like this guy is in such ill health. And I don't know why anyone would want to do that to somebody, even if they weren't that well. You'd still like to show this last bit of health, even if he was on his fading lights, right? <laughs> So, but it just shows you what you can do. Uh, and I'm going to do a longer thing on this, but I, because I mentioned, it, I'm just going to go ahead and go forward uh, and uh, temp, ask, ask um, all right, well, let me just do that. I'm just going to go back through the, through the videos again. And I'm going to ask you, don't you see, here's taken, here's a, here's a really uh, lemony yellow, really, 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 what, what, what would people call a caustic yellow, <laughs> you know, uh, um, sour, I don't know what the words are. But you can see that it does whatever else it does. If that person had a very yellow complexion, she is the red in the picture. She becomes the red. And just by definition, the human looks better feeling a little bit red. In this one down here, it feels less so. This feels like the yellow. Now, this one here, I couldn't find what I thought was a, a really good reproduction of that. So I don't want to talk about that one much. But we'll just go through this just for a couple seconds. Uh, let's go to the ones I, I uh, fancy. So here's back to that yellow again. So if this guy had a very sallow complexion, that would be a good color to make his color look good. You'll find that typically in paintings, the, the background, like in this one, is going to tend toward green or yellow. And what you're, gonna, what you're finding is that the yellow or the green will take the color out of the face. Whatever color is there, like, like it, uh, and it'll leave the, the other colors. It'll leave the reds, and it'll do it the other way around, too. So here again, using yellow in the background on the right one. And 
So I'm just going to mention that today. Um, I find that what I want to do is, is use the head as the feature color on some level. Let the background be determined by the head and not the head by the background. So that a person, if you set up a standard background and use it every time, unless you use some version of green, you're going to find yourself in, in, in trouble with certain people's faces. And even then you might. So, um, and I think I'll leave it at that. Just I want to introduce you to that thought, and I'll do, talk more about it if I haven't. Uh, I'll check around to see if I have. <laughs> but it's a fairly standard thing. Well, you can use all sorts of other colors if, if, as long as the face doesn't look ill. Uh, and that's just part of the discussion that I, I, I tend to have. But I'll do that again some other time. I'll try to look around and see what else I've already done. So that covers it in a really sloppy way, getting through that, just so because I mentioned that I was going to talk about it. All right. So that done, I will uh, uh, see you uh, in the next one. Uh, thank you again, um, uh, <clears throat> David D. and John W. And for your kind comments as well, uh, for your donations, I meant to say. Thank you all for commenting and keeping up the, um, the subscribing and uh, sharing with your friends. And um, I, I'm way behind, partly because uh, my producer was called out of town, but I'm way behind in doing a, um, a live one with you all. I am trying to be in here next, next week, the very next one, with a uh, conversation with Tom Dunley again. This one about museums, uh, as you know, some of the, some of the uh, goods and bads of museums, and, um, and uh, some, some of Gamble's thoughts on that subject as well. So, um, but then I'm hoping we'll be, I'll be in discussions trying to move along a live one again. It just seems like we can't quite get to it, and certainly not four weeks, but even six weeks is, isn't happening. All right, so with that, thank you very much, uh, and um, have a great week. See you next time.